You guys ready? As we'll ever be. You're not going to do the, she stepped on the ball joke again? No. Okay. Well, w welcome to the Lovecraft Easy podcast, everybody. Thanks for being here. Our guest today is Joe Lansdale. Hey, Joe. Hey, how are you? It's six o'clock. Uh, doing pretty good. Um, let's see here. Let's do introductions like we usually do, and then we're going to talk with Joe. Um, I'm Mike Davis, Lovecraft Easing guy, podcast, small press publisher, editor. Uh, Rick, you want to introduce yourself? I think you've actually met Joe once. I met it, Joe at uh, Phil Day Farmer's house a few years ago. Yeah. Well, it's been more than a few now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Clay, a writer and pulp magazine collector. Matt. Hi, I'm Matt. I, uh, run the easing movie night uh we will not have movie night this coming week uh, i'll be in wisconsin uh but we do have a prize which is really nice it is the dark horse graphic novel compilation of the first few issues of harrow county it's oh, a I've really heard nice that's really graphic good. novel and it's uh creepy yeah. so i think all of the viewers would like it and if you want to win it send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com Put Harrow in the subject heading. We'll draw a winner in about six weeks, and who knows? Maybe it'll be you. Can I send a? Can I send in a? As long as you put the entry on the back of a twenty-dollar bill. <laughs> Never heard that one before, Pete. Oh, Pete's leaving. I was going to have him introduce himself. Yeah. You want to introduce yourself, Pete? Or are you leaving? No, the dog needed to leave the room. Oh, okay. All right, go ahead. All right, so I'm Pete Rollick, uh, writer, uh, editor, uh, man about town, and I <laughs> not only have met Joe Lansdale several times, I um, which he won't remember at all. Um, I owe the inspiration for my first short story to Joe Lansdale. Oh, my first okay. professional sale. So well, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so this I'm is sort of like something. a little. That's a little dream come true to talk to you again. Yes, and Pete, I told you when we did the video test that Pete has a story for you. But we'll we'll get to that in a minute because I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a couple questions and a few questions, and then Pete's gonna take over. Uh, as I said before we started, uh, besides the fact that I've been wanting to talk with you for a long time, as Pete said, uh, when you talk to Joe Lanza, you can talk about horror and you can talk about Batman. So this meshes perfectly with my life um I, I will tell you and i think i told you in an email a while back that 30 years ago i read your story in the further adventures of batman it's called subway jack and for the audience you know what i don't remember any other stories in this book but for this story alone it's worth picking up uh, uh this paperback it's called the further adventures of batman uh, came out right after Batman 89, if I remember correctly, Joe. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I did with the Keaton movie inspired it. I, I must have been about 90 or somewhere in there. Yeah. And a, a couple things about that. Uh, I was going, I was, I was 20 years old. I was going through a really hard time. And it's funny how, you know, even a short story and reading it, how it can help. And I want you to know that way back when, I'm 50 now. It, it 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 was. I read it several times, and it just sort of. I, I can't explain it, but it was a help to me, and I appreciate that very much. Well, you're welcome. You know, I I hear that once in a while. Someone will say the Half and Leonard book, or this book, or this story, got me through, and and it it makes me really feel good. You know, okay. And yeah, I think we all know how you come across something that you that you read, uh, and it just yeah. it really makes a mark. It, it moves you, or helps you, you know, or teaches you something, or you know, you never know what it's going to do, but I, I, I appreciate that. And thank you for that very much. Well, thank you. I, and I think and, part and of that is 20. Good. That means I must've been about 40. <laughs> so you're 52 now. Seven. Is that right? Am I doing seven. the math correctly? <laughs> yeah. Well, part of it was, I, I, it's still 70. <laughs> <laughs> part of it was, I did, I did grow up reading DC comics and Batman was always my favorite mm -hmm. character, although I loved yeah. you know, most of the DC comics. And, you know, it, I had a tough childhood and Batman and, and the crew got me, got me through. And then, you know, after that, to read this 
And the other thing I, about this story, two things. It was my first introduction to the God of the Razor, um, and who I thought was just horrifying and so well done. And the other thing I thought when I read this book, and I, I knew nothing about you at the time, Joe, this was the first story I'd ever read of yours. And okay. I thought, I don't know who this guy is, but he really gets Batman. Just reading this story, the way that Batman acted, moved, thought, I thought he really understands the psyche of Batman. And uh, I, I wanted to throw that out there too, because, because, um, yeah. Huge well, you, you know, uh, I went through several incarnations of Batman myself growing up. I went in the 50s, you know, I was born in 51. And in 51, you had the uh, more friendly, you know, parent friendly Batman, but the science fictional elements. But there were also somehow I always could interpret the darkness in Batman, even during that period. And then you had detective comics that came along minus Robin. And uh, so and then there was the different, you know, uh, versions that came along. First of all, you know, uh, the Adam West version. And then, of course, you know, movies and I and I knew at that time that there had been serials, but I didn't see those till years later. They weren't available to see, at least for me, they weren't. So yeah. I think I was affected by all kinds of different transitions of Batman, because even in the 60s, you had different sort of transitions or different artists and writers had different takes on them, you know, Bill Finger's take and then so on and so on. And uh, so I think by the time I wrote this Batman, you had 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s incarnations of Batman plus the movie with Keaton. And I, I, I think that all of those, I was always in my own mind trying to absorb what I thought was the best aspect of it. And then later when they did Batman, the animated series, and I still think this, I think that's the best Batman that's ever been done because it captured the elements of all those things in the same way that I wanted to see it done. So, you know, that, that was important to me to do that. I had a good childhood. I had a very happy childhood but I had a very uh, comic book childhood. You know, I mm. was, other kids read comics, but I devoured them. And I would remember stuff that nobody cared about. And, you know, even I, as an adult now, think, why did I care about that? But, but it did. And I think I might yeah. still, <laughs> still care. Little, little things like that about them. And I think there are different sorts of people that read comics. There are those that kill time. There are those when they get through with them, they go in the trash. And there are those like me who, uh, you know, all of my comics is, is often the case. My mother gave to my nephews and nieces and they lasted about a day. And I had giant boxes of them, you know, but, but while I, when I got older, you know, that, that happened, but those things changed my life because when I was four years old, I started reading comics. I don't know exactly when I first read Batman, but I was reading comics at four, probably funny animal comics and things like that. Mm -hmm. But when I first read Batman, the thing that impressed me so much was that he was an expert in so many things, you know, like Sherlock Holmes or Doc Savage or people like that. But I didn't really know about Doc Savage then. I knew Holmes. But here was a guy who knew something about chemistry. He knew something about astronomy. He knew something about martial arts. He knew. And so I, I wanted to be that guy. And, uh, you know, I became a martial artist and I, I still am. And I've been one for since I was 11. So 11 minus 70 was that that's that's a long time. And I'm still doing it, you know, while I'm able to do it. Uh, but uh, to me, he changed my life because he gave me an ambition to be interested in a lot of things. Well, turned out I wasn't a very good chemist or an astronomer, but I, I was interested in science. I was interested in art. And, and my mother certainly encouraged a lot of this. And my father was a boxer and a wrestler. He was illiterate. He couldn't read or write. But he got me interested in that along with Batman because I, you know, all those things came together. But for me, my parents and comic books, especially Batman, formed my life in many ways for what I was going to do for the rest of my, my life. Because even though I didn't write just comics, mm -hmm. I did write comics and things related but it led me to wanting to read it. it led me to the discovery of Edgar Rice Burroughs and, and like Phil Farmer and I used to talk about that is that how that was like transformative, even if Burroughs is somewhat dated and there are different things that you can say about them that are probably correct, you know, for their era, they were magic to a 10 or 11 year old kid, especially I think a boy yeah. 
but comics led to that. And then that led to me reading Jack London, Rudyard Kipling. And then eventually that led to me reading, uh, you know, Matheson Bradbury because of the Twilight Zone. So all these things, there's these, you know, these markers, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, all those things kind of hit in ways. Raymond Chandler, Hammett, Kane. But, but kind of and, beginning uh, with Batman, it sounds classic. like. What's that? But kind of beginning with Batman, sounds like almost. Yeah, and trying to be Batman by educating myself. You know, I have a high school education. I have a few hours of college, about 60 over about four or five years time. But he led me to want to be more than what I might have been. You can aspire to be Batman. It, it's yeah, I, you can't yeah, aspire, I aspire to be to Superman, be right? Even though I admire Superman, well, I can't aspire yeah, to be Superman thing. or, or yeah. you know, the Flash or any, but, but you can at least aspire to go in the general direction of Batman because he was, yeah, no superpowers, right? Yeah, right. Uh, anyway, thank you for that. That was that was my first introduction. And, you know, in the 70s, he got a little bit darker. And then in the 80s, yep. he was he was starting to get more towards the Batman that uh, that you wrote in the story. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions then I'm gonna let Pete take over. Um, what? Who? OK, so that was my introduction to the God of the Razor. Um, for anyone in the audience that doesn't know, tell us what what the God of the Razor is. The God of the Razor is a, a sort of interdimensional um ruler of sharp things and he's and he's uh not not a good guy you know i, I think <laughs> no. in some other cultures they might have called him satan or they might have called him a demon and he was all of those things but he was in my viewpoint in my mythology that i created the inspiration for all of that and in his world where he is the dominant lord there are all manner of uh you know, creations and, and creatures and people who have become followers of the razor, you know, that would be God of the razor would might well be Jack the Ripper, as well as anybody that you could think of that's done malicious crimes that's never been caught for them. Um, he, it, with the razor, once you're cut with the razor, he can inhabit your form, your body. And that's how, and, and has that vampire type element as well. So to me, that's the God of the razor in a nutshell. I should point out before we get off the God of the Razor that Nightmare Magazine has uh, a story that they can you can read for free by you, God of the Razor. So, folks, oh, okay. go Google that um, Nightmare Magazine and uh, God of the Razor well, and Joe Lansdale. You know, sure I, I should have it. added that he's all co also connected to you know, all kinds of human sacrifice and like the Aztec and the cutting out of the heart. And he wears uh, heads for shoes. You know, he's right. got a hoof feet that go into those and he wears them for, for shoes and wears a top hat with the razors and carries a razor. And there are a lot of other unique elements about him, like his fingernails clicking together and making sm sparks and being sharp. And so I he's... Uh, I remember the in the story where... Scares me. I remember in the story where Gordon, Gordon and Batman aren't really sure if this guy's just, you know, hallucinating all this or if he's... And then... Gordon radios to Batman. Uh, uh, it's for real. He changes, and yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just it's a great yeah. story. But I want to stay on you that. You know what? One of the things I had the most <laughs> fun about that story, and I wrote another one. I wrote a Joker story too. Is that for whatever reason I was so interested in in writing them in different media? You know, some of it's written in short story form. Some of it's written in script. Some of it's like journals. Uh, you know, and and in other times I've done it as radio broadcast and things like that. So for me, it was a chance to experiment because at the, weirdly at that time I was reading a lot of experimental writers and, and a lot of beat writers and people of that, uh, you know, you know, interests were also influenced in what I was doing. So I was going with, and I was writing scripts and so uh, comics and things like that. So I, I added those in there. I even did one story. I think it was a Hellboy story I did and they had a, I had a, a cover painting, which was part of the story. And, and what was going on was described as a cover painting. So I've always loved that, that media and that mixed media. And that was a way to salute comics and film and fiction and all the things that have influenced me, including radio shows. Uh, well, I have one last question for you for now, and then I'm going to let Pete take over for a while. But, you know, you're very prolific. You know, you write uh, things like Happen Leonard, you write horror. Yep. 
right bat you've written batman and and so on and so forth um i think i read somewhere please correct me if i'm wrong that your inspiration for getting started in writing was a you read a story by lovecraft is that true no <laughs> no okay all right no i i i think that you know the inspiration was um comics and uh, that started way back then the weird thing, and this is where I might get thrown off the show, is I don't really love Lovecraft's writing. Oh, you're not going to get thrown I off the show. I love Lovecraft's creation. And the Lovecraft people that have influenced me were people that were influenced by him. Like Robert Block, who I knew a little and, and admired, was influenced by him. And uh, Robert E. Howard. And I mean, you could you know, make an endless list. So, And I think it's because he came up with something that is just so unique and so yeah. special. But his writing always annoyed me. Even uh, as a kid, it was too purple and, uh, you know, what the hell yeah, is an purple prose. tree yeah. anyway? Yeah, purple. purple uh, no, uh, no, 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 thrown off the show. Not at all. I, you know, I'm not, I'm more, and I've said this a million times on this show. It's not that I'm a Lovecraft fan. I'm, I, I love cosmic horror. I love weird fiction. And yeah, to me, me too. The, the, I loved the, Arthur the, Macon and, and yeah, the, uh, the, Algernon the, Blackwood. And, and I right. read those before I read Lovecraft. My mother bought me big volumes. Uh, uh, one of them was, and they're really cheap. They were like cardboard and Elmer's glue almost, but they were uh, Arthur Macon stories and they were uh, Algernon Blackwood stories. And to me, that's what Lovecraft, I thought was trying to do and failing at. But mm -hmm. I felt like that what he did was that he made this, the Thula mythos, which was bigger than what they had done and was perhaps a little bit more identifiable without being, absolute and uh that's influenced me tremendously it's influenced a lot of writers a, you know yeah I, I do a lot of realistic stuff but yeah. i also do that kind of thing and i've been in lovecraft anthologies and so i'm not belittling his impact on uh, horror or on uh you know the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st because it's there Oh, if I sat down next to Lovecraft in a bar, I don't think I'd enjoy talking with him. But to me, the the, the name Lovecraft or the Lovecraftian is just sort of a short for cosmic horror and, and sometimes weird fiction yeah, well, and so forth. I think his influence is bigger than Poe's now, you know, yeah. and, and I was a big Poe fan. When I was growing up, I had a big volume of Poe, but I think Lovecraft has surpassed him in his impact because it's not only in horror, there are concepts that have slipped over into suspense and thrillers and science fiction, because really what Lovecraft did was science fictional horror, you know, because it, it had a mm -hmm. science fictional aspect to it, you know, pseudoscience, but it was a, uh, a way for him to create something that he could at least pretend as he wrote it, that there was some real reasoning behind its existence. Right. Uh, well, I know that, uh, this might be a good way to start. Pete has a really good story about meeting you what, 25 years ago okay. and asking you to sign a couple of books and what happened there. I'm scared to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned Robert Block because I think Block was there when we did this. Um, it was at the World Horror Convention in Atlanta, which was what, yeah. 25 years ago? Oh, God. It I was before know. my it's son. It's been a while. It's been a while. I think it was in the... It was my in the hair 90s. was black and my heart was lighter then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, I um, I wanted to get some books signed by you, and Karen was there, yeah. and I brought out a hardcover of Midnight Graffiti, and mm -hmm. you took it from me, and you looked at it, and you handed it to your wife, and she looked at it, and I was like is there a problem? And like, Karen's like, yeah, we didn't sign a contract for a book club. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, this is, well, she, she said, well, you know, I have two copies. Will you sign one of them for me? And she's like, yeah, but can we take the other one? So we could, <laughs> we want to have it for proof. And yeah, um, yeah. so the funny thing is that, you know, she gave me the business card of your horse veterinarian with her address <laughs> on the back. <laughs> what? So that, yeah. So that I could. Well, you never card. know when you're going to need a horse veterinarian, Pete. 
so uh, that I could send my address to her and so that she could send me something in return. And I went from having an extra copy of Midnight Graffiti to getting the Magic Wagon yeah. hardcover slipcase edition. Yeah. So fair That's trade. my wife. <laughs> yeah. Very fair trade. Um, That's great. It is. And it's funny because I think right after that, I think um, the bottoms came out mm-hmm. maybe a couple of years later. I walk yeah. into Barn- I walk into Barnes and Noble. And there they have like the bottoms in, a, in like displayed. And they're like, new and emerging writer, Joe Lansdale. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I have been reading Joe Lansdale since 1984. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, and uh, that, happens in, that happens in writing. When they find you, they, they, you have no history prior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, suddenly you're on the scene and it's like, what? No. And like at that point, the Joe Lansdale bibliography was was in my mind huge. Oh, well, I'm it just was, excited yeah. that we have emerging writer Joe Lansdale on the show today. Yeah. That's but, right. <laughs> That's right. I, I always feel that way in some ways is because I'm I'm a very changeable writer. I, I'm I, I recreate myself a lot and, and it's not consciously, it just it happens because my interests are broad. I don't think of myself as a horror writer or a crime writer or any of those. I'm a writer and right. I happen to write a lot of things, including crime. If someone says that's a crime story or a horror story or, you know, okay. But a, a lot of them, I think of myself as being the Lansdale genre because I feel like I just bring what I want to those stories that interest me. Now I'm a professional writer. So with uh, little Brown, I have contracts there. They say, we want a crime story. Well, I, I find some element of crime, but you have to understand too, they published um, Edge of Dark Water, which is kind of crime. They did The Thicket, which is historical Western. Paradise Guide, definitely historical Western. It won the Spur, not the Edgar. (laughs) So, you know, it's a lot of stuff like that that I've done. Uh, You know, Jane Goes North, which is just a story about two women on a road trip that goes very, very bad. And uh, Fender Lizards about a girl living in a trailer park in East Texas. I mean, I, I've got a long, long list, especially in short stories, of variable types of fiction. You know, I've written love stories. I've written two. Right. And uh, both of them were published in Italy first. So I think that's kind of funny, you know. So in that way, I always, I, the problem is if you get horror writer on your name, then it's like you've done nothing else. And I don't mind no. that. And if I had done nothing but horror, I'd be just as proud as a, 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 a red rooster. But yes. I have not done just horror. I've done all kinds of things. And uh, so it's nice to be acknowledged as a writer, as an author, more than anything else. If I can throw in one last thing before Pete no. goes on. You mentioned in an interview, <laughs> thanks. You, you mentioned in an interview with Tyler Jones uh, that you, you said you were frightened of becoming a bestseller that was caught in the bestseller loop. Same yep. characters, more yep. or less the same plot line, that yep. sort of thing. Well, it, it, don't get me wrong. It's like, like, I'd love to be a bestseller, but always on my own terms. And my own yeah. terms are too strict for them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I, I sell well. I mean, I can't complain because I'm, as my agent says, I'm a long seller. And uh, people really love my work. And it, I've got books that I wrote in the, in the uh, 80s that are still selling, you know. And uh, so I, I can't complain about that. I'm not as rich as my buddy George Martin, but I'm well off. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not suffering. I don't get up in the morning having to worry about if I have enough to uh, pay my bills anymore. You know, that could change. There's all kinds of radical stuff in your life that can um, you know, crap on you and, and, and put you in a bad position, but it's been really good to me. And though Hap and Leonard are a series and there are certain aspects in a series that people expect to see again, I don't do it for that reason. I do it because I expect to see certain things again, but I always try to make them somewhat different. I've used different kinds of, I guess, crime tropes in them. And I've, then I've tried to twist those uh, crime tropes. I've tried to write sort of mainstream elements in the novels at the same time. I'm not afraid to go off on a trail. I don't believe that old thing, take out everything if it doesn't, you know, enhance the plot. Uh, I think stories, you know, I think of myself as a a, a writer, you know, and I'm trying to tell stories that are 
driven by genres, so that are sometimes purely genre, very noticeably so. But a lot of it, I think I also bring in the other influences of Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Faulkner and, uh, you know, uh, Flannery, like I said, Flannery O'Connor, Carson McCullers, Harper Lee, all of those different writers have influenced me. And uh, I could just have easily have become a full-time Western writer, a full-time mainstream writer. I could have done all those things and just chosen one and stuck to it. I could have become a young adult writer, a children's writer, because I love all those things. But I'm, my makeup isn't that way. My makeup is I want to do a lot of different things. And that keeps you, too, from the bestseller list to some extent, because they don't know what to do with you. Because you, you write this and this a couple of times. They go, now we know what he does. And they go, OK, we don't know what he does. How do we put this in a box? How do we market it? And right. uh, so there are so many reasons. But due to the fact that I just keep selling and my old books keep coming along, I have great foreign sales, especially in Italy, where I am a bestseller. And uh, I have film um, you know, options and things being made into films and uh, comic books. And so if something's kind of down for me right then, I can easily move to another uh, media that I enjoy writing. Well, it's a really great thing to be a success, but on your own terms, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's admirable. But anyway, Pete. So on that note, you know, a friend of mine, he runs a comic book store. Okay. I said, I'm going to interview Joe Lansdale. And he says, oh, the horror Western comic writer. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cause that's what yeah. he knows. Yeah. You're he always knows. right. <laughs> you know, he's they're always like, right, but they're always wrong. Yeah, Jonah yes, Hex, yes, I the Lone that. Ranger, Dead those are my favorite, favorite, favorite of all the comics I've done. Uh, Jonah like Hex Jonah are my Hex absolute stuff? favorites, huh? Yeah, yeah the no, Jonah I Hex. love that. I, yeah, everything I did with Tim Truman is is uh, you know among my favorites, and you know I've done some other things. I did X Files with my son. We did two issues of the X Files, and I've I've done um, some stuff with my brother. We did some Robert Block adaptations for IDW. We did the right. Hellbound Train, which is one of my favorite things that I did with, and I did that with John, my brother. And uh, we did uh, yours truly, Jack the Ripper and other, you know, other things like that. I got to do Lovecraft. I, I did uh, the Dunwich Horror. For and, IDW. Uh, for, I think that was, uh, was that IDW too? Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, I've done a lot of things. I've done a lot of, uh, I've played in other people's sandboxes. So some people might say I've, I've taken a crap in some of their sandboxes, <laughs> but I've always tried like a cat. But I've always tried to write the stories I wanted to write. And I don't, and you know, I try to owe a certain allegiance to people and creations that I work with, but I never feel like I'm trying to copy them. They were already themselves. So I am just honoring them by being interested enough to play with the toys that they have, you know, that they create. Pete, so, Joe, would, Joe would love to be here, wouldn't he? Yeah. Talking, talk, Joe Pulver would love to be here talking to Joe Lanzo. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So you you mentioned um, Tim Truman. You do a yeah. lot of work with Tim Truman, and it, you guys seem to yeah, play off. He does a lot of covers for me, and yeah, yeah, he does a lot of book covers and different things like that. So yeah, I love Tim. Tim and I are like brothers. <laughs> How did that relationship come about? And you know, as accidental, really. I I remember Dean Koontz saw something of Tim's, and he said, "This guy draws like you write." I remember that. <laughs> way way back you know and i thought well that's interesting i know tim's work and i agree with that i think we have a a kinship you know a certain element uh, about us at least in a, in a lot of our work and uh dc comics had wanted tim to do something and i i don't know if tim recommended me or somebody else recommended me but they wanted us to to team up and we just hit it off with just perfect we were in the same groove you know and we just had a marvelous time doing Jonah Hex and you know we caused that whole stir with the second uh set of of stories where the Winter Brothers sued us uh yeah. you know and lost by the way and uh we did Lone Ranger we did Conan uh and and little bits and little short pieces that we did like Br'er Hoodoo and I I can't think what else but we did we did a lot of work and he's done a tremendous number of covers and illustrations for my work and I have some of them on my wall here you nice know, uh so I, I loved I loved him. I think think the world of him. He's also a good writer. He wrote a lot of the Conan comics and other kinds of comics. And he's a he's a great creator, and and he's a good person. I, and his family uh, and is similar to our, to our own family. So I I, I really appreciate him. So 
when I read these comics, you know, you see, you see things like the worms of the earth and, you know, I get a real cosmic horror feel from it that I automatically, when I was younger, attributed to Lovecraft. But yeah, as yeah. I've gotten older and expanded my reading list, I realize it's really Robert E. Howard. Yeah, well, Howard and and like I said, for me, Algernon Blackwood and Arthur Macon and 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 what's funny is that I, I'm also known for being very graphic and things, but I'm also I've written a lot of stuff that isn't, and and but people don't remember that they <laughs> they remember the graphic, but yeah. you know I was influenced by it all. You know, Robert Block for his era was very graphic, which was funny because yeah. later he thought other people were too graphic. Every generation thinks that they understand where the line is, you know, but there's <laughs> somebody's always pushing the line. And uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, there, Howard was a bigger influence on me as a child, you know, or, or as a teenager, I guess really as a teenager, I, I think I was 17. No, I'll take it back. I was 18 years old. I even remember where I was and where I was sitting when I read uh, my first Howard stuff, which was uh, Wolf's Head, it was a collection of short stories. But oh. the thing that I remember best about it was the introduction about not having some son of a bitch standing over him telling him what to do. And that was, and I was working at the aluminum chair factory then. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's what I want. You know, I've always wanted to be a writer. Uh, originally, I just wanted to be one because I wanted to be one. And then I realized people got paid and that there was such a thing called a career as time went on. And when I was, uh, I was going to Tyler Junior College then, and in fact, I had sued them so I could not have to cut my hair. And I won that lawsuit, by the way, which went nationwide. But um, uh, Lansdale versus TJC, if you ever want to look at it. <laughs> but the uh, I came across this paperback, Wolf's Head, and I, I read, I still have that same paperback. And that was a big influence on me, but it was the introduction even more than the stories. I greatly enjoyed the stories, but when I read that introduction, I understand. And if you've ever been to Cross Plains, you know why the poor guy shot himself. I mean, there is nothing, nothing there. It's one of the ugliest places on earth. I did uh, I did some work with Vincent D'Onofrio not long ago, and he played Robert E. Howard in The Whole Wide World. Those right. of us who are Howard fans know that. And uh, he greatly enjoyed it, but he was saying the guy, like I always thought, he was mentally ill. Howard was was mentally ill. Maybe, maybe bipolar, maybe schizophrenic, I don't know. But also, I know that when they shot that movie, they didn't shoot it in cross planes, and there's a reason for that. It's just drab as hell. And so a lot of the movies actually shot around, look like Austin and some other places, but maybe even some out in California. I don't know, but most of it looked to have been shot around Austin and areas therein. But this poor guy is out there working, making more money than the lawyers, than the doctors. You know, his dad was a doctor, than anybody in the town. And then people would not give him any respect. And I've been through this too, because I grew up a little later, but it's the same thing is what's this guy doing, making up stories that isn't manly, you know, right. but, uh, and he had to deal with that constantly. And I never thought he shot himself because his mother died. I think that was just the period on a, uh, a series of reasons why he took his life, you know, and, uh, but nonetheless, definitely for me, more of an influence than than uh, Lovecraft, although I, you know, I took a different route with that too than than Howard, but he was there, and uh, the fact that he was a Texas boy, the fact that he lived in some small town, the fact that he had to deal with people that didn't understand, did not appreciate, uh, and even thought it was like the wrong thing for people to be doing, you know, as they used to say when I was growing up, what are you always reading them old man-made books for? <laughs> because they thought the Bible was this given word from God and was not a man-made book. And so I know he went through all of that. And so I feel a kinship to Howard, if not a depression like he had. I never had that. And I was always popular in school. People, you know, like me. I never had that, you know, outsider obviousness. But I always felt that inside I was something of an outsider because I was interested in different things and I had a different viewpoint. But I, like I said, in school, I was always popular. I you know, dating girls, doing all that sort of stuff. So my, and I was a tough guy for real. <laughs> so my, uh, my experiences are somewhat different. And then Howard and I have certain areas where we connect. He was a boxing fan. I did boxing some and martial arts and, and wrestling and all these different things. So 
I understood that physicality that he craved. And also he wanted to be recognized for that so that people wouldn't think he was one of these, uh, you know, sort of weenie writers that, uh, that they had this sole stereotype of uh, being people that, you know, couldn't deal with the real world. And obviously he, he, I think he battled against that as well. You mentioned, um, you know, the introduction and, and having the freedom of not having somebody stand over you and tell you what you did, what to yeah. do. Is, yeah. is that part of your attraction to small press? Because you, yeah. from the beginning to now, you're still heavily involved in small press. Uh, yeah, I mean, I write for the big press too, obviously. I mean, uh, and right. they're the ones that I, that, you know, I write that really put the big beans on my table, but uh, the others make the salads and I kind of like both. And, uh, but it's also a, a, a situation where I have the opportunity to write stories that I might not be able to write for a big mainstream publisher. Right. And me not wanting to take the normal course of trying to be the big bestseller because uh, I might want to turn around and write uh, a Reverend Mercer story, which is, a uh, you know, the Weird West, which I started writing about in the early 80s. And uh, that's not something that normally big publishers are going to do. But I have publishers like Subterranean, for example. Right. And um, is it Stygian Sky? Is that how you say it? Uh, I've started doing some things for them. And, uh, you know, and there are other presses. I've always liked the little guy. But that doesn't mean I'll, I'll do it for nothing or do it no. for you because you, the ones that have made me mad when people come to me and say, well, you know, do this for free because I know you want to support the small press. And I write back, <laughs> not that much. <laughs> yeah, I, I've gone through that myself. I can myself. sell it anywhere, you know? I can yeah. sell it anywhere. So why, why should I do it for you? And what makes you so important when I can choose another right. that I may prefer that also is willing to publish it right or to pay me right. But on that said... I have done things for free. Right. The thing about what you might call the legit small press is that so many of them, yeah. they want to publish a story because of course they want to make money, but they want to publish a story because they want to get it out there, you know, and that's not something necessarily yeah. that the, that the big press. Right. Do. Yeah, no, that's true. That that's true. And you know, the, the, you can always tell the ones that say they don't, you know, that you're doing this for love and don't want to make money. I always say, do you make money? And the answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. And so my take yeah. on that is that, you know, you're not going to flatter me into being an artiste because, <laughs> I, you know, like Robert E. Howard and like Starving people, artists. I write for a living and I can certainly take my chances from time to time and do it for nothing or do it for less. Or I've done it for friends. I've done it for what I thought were worthy ideas or something just caught me right. And I wanted to tell that story, but I can really, if someone comes to me, and, and I have a couple of anthologies I'm supposed to do stories for. But if someone comes to me and says, would you do a story uh, that has a dog in it? We're doing a dog book. Well, what I know, any of that stuff, I can do that for myself without even needing you, you know? So yeah. if I choose to do that, it's because I, I really want to do it, not only because I want to do it, but I want to do it for that particular market. But sometimes I realize that they're not offering me anything I couldn't do anyway. Are, are, isn't there a dark regions press book about mental illness yes. coming out? I, I think I'm in I, that. I think so. I don't, I don't know. I'm not in it. You're not in it. Okay. Uh, speaking of books so. coming not, out, not, not, though. About, not about mental illness that I'm aware of. Okay. Speaking, speaking of books coming out, though, Pete, or something. Um, <laughs> it looks, I see a tweet from Brian, Brian Keen, uh, the drive-in multiplex, a tribute to yep. Joe R. Lansdale's The Drive-In with Blood and Popcorn. Yeah. Pre-orders right. begin this June, July. So, so yeah, so yeah. the drive-in series is, is not a series that I think you could sell to a mainstream publisher. I did. <laughs> but you did. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I sold it to Bantam, uh, and uh, they, they did it. And they were, they were certainly, at that time, a mainstream paperback publisher. Right. And paperbacks, one of the beauties about the old paperbacks is they used to do all kinds of things. And that's, that's one thing they did. And it's been continuously in print since then. And it was sold hardback in uh, Britain. Right. And so there's, you know, you never, you never really know. But what I would say is that it is very much a cult sort of book. And it is one of those books that I'm happy to say has inspired a tremendous number of people to write to become writers or to say, I don't have to stick to any set rules. Right. They don't, they, you know, they don't matter really. It's story that matters. 
And I've always been happy that when I did my weird Westerns back in the early eighties, not that I've, not that other people hadn't done weird Westerns before, but I kind of got a name for them and I influence people that influence other people that have no idea that I influence them. <laughs> for the uh, folks who have not read, fiction, you know, a lot of my short stories and the drive in, they were bizarro fiction before that title was there. Yes. You know? Yeah. For the folks who have not read the drive in series uh, by Joe, uh, in the show notes uh, under books for your TBR, I've got the link to that. And uh, it also, it looks like, uh, wow, you've got some good names on this uh, tribute right. anthology, Joe. Uh, our, yeah, well, Brian friend King Laird. and Christopher Golden deserve yeah. credit for putting it together, you know. And, yeah. Uh, it's, it's got some friends of mine, and it's, it's got, it's got oh, some Chet, new people. Chet's going to be in there. Well, That's like, nice. Well, see, and Chet's my buddy, and he's just a great writer. And, he's a good uh, guy. He's a writer who should have had a lot larger career than he had. Um but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because there are people in my generation that were influenced by it. There were people behind that. And there are people in this book who are new to me. And and what they did when they did this, they tried to pick people who actually had that book had had some impact for them, like Owen King. And that's Joe great. King has said the same thing, you know. And and so that's what's wonderful about this book to know that, you know, my DNA it has sort of mingled in or, or intermingled with all of these different creators. And some of them uh, I've had the same from filmmakers and comic people. And uh, all I was doing was just trying to write a story and get paid for it. <laughs> you got <laughs> uh, fun doing it. You got Josh Mallerman, Stephen Graham Jones, yes. Larry Barron, uh, Jonathan. Oh, I love Gans. Steven. I've read oh, Stephen's yes. story. It's killer. It is killer. My, my son and I are the holdout. We're, Linda we're still Addison. Oh, God, I love Linda Addison. Yeah. We're, Keith and I are writing Hoppity White Rabbit Done Broke Down. And we're, we're, it's getting long. So we haven't finished it yet, but we're working on it. Well, anyway, uh, to the audience, uh, you got that to look forward to. So, Pete. Yeah, all right. So we've been dancing around. You talk about weird Westerns and, you know, and, I honestly, I didn't pick it up because I didn't see it, but my friend who runs the comic book shop just handed me one day, is it the Steam Man of the Plains? Right, Steam Man of the Prairie and the Dark the Prairie, Riders yes. Down. Which yeah. is just this, you know, bizarro uh, Wizard of Oz, steampunk, cosmic horror nightmare. Yeah, at, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, which you clearly see the influence of Edisonian on and uh, Philip Jose Farmer. I don't know what Edisonian is, but I, I do now, but I didn't know what that was. And I saw the thing where they talked about, it was very Edisonian. And I said, well, what the hell's that? Yeah. And so I looked it up I, and, and it turned out I was, I, I was actually aware of the stuff without knowing that's what it was or what right. it was called, you know? So to, for the audience, if you don't know when Thomas Edison was alive, there were a whole sort of fan based novels and short stories written with of him as the main character as sort of like this science genius um and i i've, yeah, I've actually never heard of that i i yeah. missed that all together so when i saw that i thought i gotta find out what that is yeah and when i it, did i went well you know that kind of fits <laughs> yeah it was sort of like tom swift goes to mars but instead it was edison yes well i read those old tom swift when i was good and i read mm -hmm. I mean, when i was good when i was young when i was good and young <laughs> and I read uh, the Tom Swift Jr. as well. I didn't read all of them, but I read a handful, you know, of those here and there. But the library I had had the old Tom Swift, which were the really original ones, which were, uh, I had a totally different flavor. And then they started the Tom Swift Jr., you know, later. So I had little sprinklings of all that. And I, I tried to bring every element of anything that had ever influenced me in a broad way into that story. And I got a lot of it. You, it is a wild ride, and if if somebody asks me, give me a, a book that encompasses everything that Joe Lansdale loves. It's it's that book because it is told yeah. with such an adoration of the genre. Right, and you know they did a comic of it too. There was yes. a comic from I think that was that IDW or Dark Horse. I can't remember. I think Maybe it might have been Dark Horse. Horse. Yeah. But I could be wrong. And uh, so, and that was cool. You know, they had to back off on a few things, <laughs> but yeah. they, they did a really good, 
a really cool adaptation. And you know, the thing that that's not mentioned that's really at the heart of all of that is a writer, Philip Jose Farmer. Yeah, we, we, yeah. One of my yeah. most favorite writers and one of my greatest influences, not my only influence, but uh, you know, I, I think that probably his imagination really inspired my imagination. It probably inspired people like uh, Neil Barrett and Howard Waldrop and, and people like that as well as many others. But he made us look at things that's, and find the juxtaposition between things that didn't seem to fit. Right. That's what and, he did. And, and he, he had a way of bringing the old, right, children's literature or pop literature. He had a way of bringing it into a more modern psychological, um, you know, Freudian, Jungian sort of uh, uh, influence. And he brought all of those things into the work. And therefore, when I read him, I, I was like swallowing that stuff. I said, wow, this yeah. is this is my meat. This is me, you know. In in many ways, I think of Phil Jose Farmer as the Alan Moore before there was an Alan Moore. Oh, long before. Long yeah. before. Yeah. Just um Pete, Pete yeah. uh, real quick. You, I think unless I missed it, at the beginning you said that uh Joe inspired you to begin writing. Uh what was that story that you wrote? What story inspired you? So Joe has a story on the far side of the Cadillac Desert. With dead folks. With dead folks. <laughs> and something about that title stuck in my head. And it worked around in there for like six months. And out popped this story set after the rapture. Where all the people have been left behind. And they're living in Los Angeles. Because where else would you live? or vegas and every day or vegas, that's right <laughs> that's right but every day the dawn breaks with the cherub singing hosannas and oh, i love it yeah and um trying to survive or in this the city of angels when death is not an option anymore because the rapture has come and gone. Everybody who was going to be harvested has been harvested. Good and riddance, I'd that's say. That's a great right. idea. That's and, a great idea. The story have called, a more peaceful life if those people would all get raptured. Yeah. But the story is called <laughs> On the Far Side of the Apocalypse. And did I say that very out loud? cool. Did I say that out loud? Yes, you did. Very, very, very cool. You know, Twain, Twain always said all the interesting people were in hell. Yes, which gives us exactly. the heroes in hell stories, right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, the big secret is that the angels have been left behind too. Because there's no need for them anymore. So good idea. There did that appear? Uh Tailbones magazine. Okay. You know, another, you know, it's, it's a small press magazine, but you know. I, I, I submitted to Death Realms. They said they said they would liked it, but they didn't want it. Um, and they, they suggested Tailbones, and Tailbones took its site, you know, like within Good. two days. I know, I know of them. I, 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 yeah, I've read. So I think they may have done an interview with me or something. I think I've had some connection to them. Probably. I've done so many, I have to admit that sometimes I forget which ones. <laughs> I've just read which ones I'm in, you know. And, and yeah, exactly. And this is, be, you know, when you're prolific like you, you get your author's copies and like, okay it's going i'm going to read it i swear i'm going to read it and then yeah you, there's so much more you have to read that that yeah i i do a lot of reading you know i try to do most of my reading for fun because i believe that's why i write the way i want to because right? I, I i enjoy myself you know i do some reading that's for you know work but but to me that is that is reading for work is enjoying myself is putting the right fuel in the tank you know, I, I don't believe in this sort of thing where you suffer for writing. I think that's bullshit. You know, I, I, I love what I do. And it may be difficult sometimes, but generally speaking, I, I don't find it that hard as compared to working in aluminum chair factories, being a bouncer, working in uh, rose fields and being a janitor for seven years, which wasn't really hard. But, you know, it's it's not the most endearing career for me I, in my look. I respect all those things. I've done all those things. I've worked at tearing down houses. I've done, you know, worked on the a garbage truck, just about every job you can imagine. So for me to be a writer, um, 
I don't feel like I'm suffering that much. You know? Now it's, uh, it, yeah. there are worse ways to live. I mentioned, yeah. I mentioned how your story was one of the things that got me through when I was 19, 20 years old. Uh, yes. Joe. So, well, at the same time, my aunt and uncle got me a job uh, at uh, basically this factory that had a contract with the government making bomb shells, you know, just the shells. Okay. My job was to stand on an assembly line for 10 hours a day. And when the bombshell came down to my part, which they moved pretty fast, was to put my spec tools and make sure that it was up to specs and then move it on if it was. And, you know, if you need to go to the bathroom, you better make it quick because they're going to they're going <laughs> to pile up, you know. Yeah. So uh, this lady comes up to me. I was 20. She must have been 35, 40. And she's like, you don't know how lucky you are to have this job at such a young age. You know, this is you got great job security here. You know, you you can be, you can be here for, for a very long time. And she thought she was. Okay. Yeah, she thought she was like, uh, you know, pat me on the back and saying, you know, yeah, you, you've I, done I've good. I've had that. I've, uh, I've had but, that. But, but I, I, I was I went, horrified. I was horrified. Yeah, that's me, too. I, I and I was wondering because I, you know, I had a high school education and a little bit of college. And I was thinking, am I going to be doing this the rest of my life? You know, uh, I don't want to yeah. do this for the rest of my life. And all I could and see I was the next the 40 years I sold, I standing was, on that assembly I was 20, line. 21, you know, and that from 21, I moved on. And by the time I was 29, I was full-time writer. And yeah. probably it was probably mid thirties before I was really clicking and making, you know, a, a really good living. And my wife quit work and went to work for me. And uh, we tripled our income because I was able to uh, work uh, more regular hours. I only work about three hours a day. That's, that's always been, I get diminishing returns. I remember Dean Koontz and some other writers telling me that they like to start and build over the day, but I, I'm sort of built as much as I'm going to be <laughs> when I start. And then the house starts to collapse if I, <laughs> if I keep going. So I, I work about three hours a day and I have a general guideline of three to five hours, but sometimes I get more than that. And that works for me, but that sure beats the hell out of aluminum yeah. chair factory or or a mobile home factory and stuff like that for, you know, eight hours a day plus or standing on time, assembly plus line. lunchtime. And yeah, it's just not, not, not what I wanted out of life. I respect anybody doing those things. Sure. I'm not you know, looking at bills. I'm not looking down on anybody that does that, but when she said no, that, but I, 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 I saw myself for the next 40 years on that line and yeah. I quit. Yeah. You know, I just, well, you know, um, I, Neil Barrett has a book out about the Al Dare series and somewhere in there, I don't remember the exact thing he's talking about. So some people feel that they, that they can take pride in and be glad to have a job like being a janitor. He says, and I don't believe this is true. Is <laughs> what Al Dare says, but you know, if I'd owned the janitor company, then I probably liked it a whole lot better. You know? Yeah. All right. So Joe, you've had a bunch of your stuff turned into I mean, you've done a lot of screenwriting, but then you've also had stuff turned into television and film. Some kind of Boba yeah. Hotep. Well, yeah. thanks, Mike. Boba I was Hotep. going to get there. Yeah, you just had to say Boba that. Hotep was the first. That was the I first had to say that. That was ever filmed. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Batman animated series, I guess, was first. But I mean, the first of my own work uh, was Bubba Hotep, and then you know there was Cold in July, the Happen Letter television series, and. Some of my stuff's been adapted for Love, Death, and Ro Robots, and mine and my daughter and my son's stuff have been has been adapted for Creep Show. One of our stories adapted for Creep Show, and uh, Show uh, Showtime did Instead on and Off a Mountain Road. And I just wrote a script that George produced based on a Howard Waldrop story called Night of the Cooters, and uh, Vincent D'Onofrio <laughs> directed and starred in it, and it's about a 30 minute long film i think and it was done with uh, live action as well as tri trioscope that's and, a um uh, that's a uh, war of the world story right yes yes yeah. in the in uh west texas yeah kind Loved of at the turn real. of the century there yeah yeah so you've done this um honestly you know i i i, I love bubba hotep I can't show it to my kids. So do I. Me, me too. Oh, my son loves it too. 
I was hoping, or I was going to ask you too, if you loved the, the film version, and I am so happy to hear that you do. Yeah, I do. It's my favorite adaptation of my stuff. You know, Don called me on the phone out of the blue and asked to come visit for a few days. And he came and we talked about different things to be made and, and uh, none of those happened. Uh, but then he later went home and he, and he read Bubba and he read Instant On Off of Mountain Road and he optioned both of those and he filmed both of them. Um, you know, and I think we might have worked together later on, but it just, it just never happened. I never really wanted to do a sequel to Bubba Hotep. I felt like it did its thing. I wrote a prequel book, but I felt like that was a different thing. And, uh, yeah, but I, I just never found it yesterday. really, yeah, but I never really you wanted to, send to that do to me, that, Pete. but I would have loved to have done something else with Don. Um, I think part of the problem is Don was, you know, he did things, uh, inexpensively and I would, you know, I became a member of the writer's guild and I couldn't write for those prices. And, uh, and then he, uh, just, you know, he never, he wrote the script for Bubba Hotep based on my story, which is a real close adaptation, extraordinarily close. And I appreciated that. And so I kind of wish we'd have worked together. I, I worked with Jim Mickle on two projects, um, Cold in July. He did the film. He directed it. And him and uh, Nick Domici, uh, Domici wrote the script for Cold in July and, and had a part in it. And he and Jim did uh, the um, Happen Leonard television series as well. And, um, you know, so I've, I've had two and two that I'm very happy with. And uh, Tim Miller's, you know, I love uh, my stuff being adapted for Love, Death, and Robots, and uh, you know, different people work on those, but but Tim's uh, one of the big dogs there. That him and David Fincher, and so you know, it's it's great. And and, and uh, you know, Greg Nicotero had Creep Show, and I've known Greg for years, so it was fun to have a story I'd written with the kids uh, adapted by a friend of mine, uh, Matt Vain. Yeah, were you were you on the set of Bubba Hotep? Were you an extra? Yes, my son and I both were. Okay, I thought so. Yeah. That's where I met Bruce. That's how we became friends. As I met him on the set. Yeah. What was your reaction when you when you heard that he was going to be cast? Or Excited, you know, you know I, I but I never visualized him in that part. I have to admit, but yeah. my son did, and my son kept saying they need to get Bruce Campbell, and I said, well, they don't ask me. I mean, but Don did ask me for some suggestions, and I threw out some, and uh, I, and, you know, he had different people in mind that he he came to me and said well, what about bruce campbell and as soon as he said it i thought oh yeah that, that my son's right that he would be good and, you know keith had great. mentioned it and uh, it kind of put it in my head but once and then once i saw him on the set and once uh, you know i got to know him too it's just that um there's a guy that's had a really good career but he is 10 times better than people give him credit for because he makes it look easy yeah. I also loved him on uh, Burn Notice, if you've seen that yeah, show. Yeah, he was good on that. I, I loved uh, uh, the, oh, what was the Western series he was on? Briscoe, uh, Briscoe County, County Junior. Briscoe County yeah, Junior, like when he was younger, yeah. 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 Sort of the wild, wild west later. <laughs> yes, yeah. And again, a, a kind of weird fiction version too, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're a Campbell fan, anybody out there and you've not seen Burn Notice, uh, uh, Bruce Campbell is not the star, but he's the secondary character and he steals the show quite often. Every he's, time he's, he's on. A, yeah. He's just a great character and a great actor. Yeah. So yeah, he is. So, yeah. Uh, Pete, what else you got? Anything? I got, uh, so, Joe, you mentioned you work about three hours a day. Is that, yeah. Was, so what is your what's your schedule like what's what's your how do you do that i i just get up in the morning and i have coffee and uh usually i have a, some you know toast or an oatmeal or something and i go to work and work i do smarter I do not harder email. pete yeah, yeah i do my email first and then i'll look at my fan page i don't really I, there's a facebook page but i never look at it so when people say you know friend me i never friend anybody because i don't ever look at it but I do, a, I do have a fan page and I look at it and sometimes I'll look at the Lansdale collector page because yep. I might have some information somebody's seeking or something like that. And then I dive into whatever it is I'm working on. And I, I just, you know, I, I almost the moment my fingers hit the keys, I'm gone. I don't really have to think too much about it. There are some occasions when I did, but I, I don't like saying I find writing easy, but I find it a lot easier than most. And uh, I, 
but I feel like I have a real style and a real voice. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my subconscious does the work for me at night before I get up in the morning. It, it knows what it, I'm going to do. And so I don't think about it. And I don't plot. I don't lay out plots or outlines or anything like that. I, I'm surprised daily, you know. Joe, I'm not trying to butter you up, but you, you've had such a tremendous go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. You're, you've had such a tremendous influence on so many readers and writers in so many ways and in different genres. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. huh. The writing world and the reading world is better off with you in Thank it. You. It really is. Um, when it comes to the word to horror, what does what does horror mean to you uh, personally, as as a writer and a reader? I think when I was younger, it was just the idea of being scary. You know, m mainly in the sense of monsters and and supernatural things, right. uh, which I don't believe in. You know, maybe, maybe that's what made, but but it was a thrill nonetheless. Sure. But I think horror is too broad for me to actually put it in one singular box. And I think people try too hard to do that, to say mm -hmm. horror is this, or crime is this, or suspense is this. We all do it some. I mean, there's horror, there's supernatural, there's realistic, you know, there, there's bizarro, there, you know, whatever. But I don't really think about any of those things when I'm doing them. I just think I want to write a story that, and, and I'll find that it has elements of discomfort, or it may have elements of surprise. Uh, and I learned from Bob Block that humor makes horror better it, yeah. it actually makes it sometimes more frightening you know these jolly things that are going <laughs> going on while these horrible situations are there you know and uh I, I think that they're flip sides of the same coin because you can you can take somebody into like we use a horror movie for example and you see somebody watch it and it's just the scariest thing ever and then somebody else come in and it's funny to them because it's they they catch the silly note they see yeah. it when it's and you know I mean, I've had that happen when I'm really deep into something. Somebody else is, you know, just hooting and hollering and and not laughing at what I would think of as a as a, a funny moment, but to them, it is. And so that I think that's one of the things about horror. It's so much in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but you know, a lot of crime novels I think are horror. I mean, Silence of the Lambs is oh, cool. not only yeah. crime; it's suspense. It's horror. Um, you know, I think that a lot of suspense. Um, novels that came late 80s and early 90s were very much influenced by horror and I think in particular those of us who wrote on the undercurrent you know the undercurrent writers are sometimes highly influential you know everybody knew Stephen King you know they 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 knew Peter Straub and they knew Whit Whitley Strieber at least for a while and you know you could uh, uh, Rick McCammon you can name others there but there was this whole undercurrent underneath it that for better or worse, you know, they weren't necessarily better or, or, or worse than the ones I listed, but they had a different kind of influence because they were more like the beat poets, even if they weren't writing something like that. They were ap appealing to a really dedicated and vocal minority. And that minority, though, is where the DNA got put into the, you know, the next generation more maybe even then, you know, King and others like that, but equally in its own way, but maybe a smaller group of people, more people read King than read us all together. But the people who read us, they, they said, this is different. We're getting something unique here. And in that era, it most definitely was that. You mentioned crime. I mean, if the movie seven isn't horror, then I don't know what is. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you could go all day. And you know, the yeah. other thing, like in some of my crime novels, I think what I brought from horror is atmosphere, uh, you know, a sense of menace. And it's not that crime hadn't done that before, but I think it became a more obvious ingredient after the early and middle eighties. And uh, I mean, you can go back to uh, uh, David Goodis and Jim Thompson and, you know, James Kane, and there's a sense of horror there, but there's a delicious sense of it after the uh, early and middle eighties, I think. Uh, my a friend of mine, not more than that, yes. it's kind of an upsetting kind of aspect to it. It got to the point to where everybody was looking for the darkest way to go. And that included me, but at some point you go, that's enough because there's nowhere else to go with that. What else can I do character wise? What else can I do idea wise? 
How, what, how could I bring social issues to this, et cetera, et cetera? Pete? A, a friend of mine, uh, Adam Troy Castro, has reimagined the Three Stooges. I know Adam Troy Castro. Okay. So yeah. you know, he did the, the Three Stooges as avatars of chaos. <laughs> and I don't know him personally. I just want to make Love that it. clear, but I know who he is and I've, I've seen his work. You know. Yeah, he's a good writer. But you know, the idea that the Three Stooges are horrific people and are monsters yeah. in their own right. You, know, you never want them to show up at your house. Right. You know, I, I wrote a story called Drive In Date once, and it's about two serial killers. And I was so tired of all these serial killers being geniuses and all that sort of stuff, because mostly they're not. The, no. they're, they get away with things a lot of times because they, you know, they might be clever like a fox, but a fox can be clever, but he can't do arithmetic. So it doesn't necessarily mean he's smart, or, or, but it means that they have a knack for what they do or they learn as they go. And I wrote about two guys, the serial killers at the drive-in theater, talking about the problems in their life. And they're, they're sort of banal and sort of crude and sort of stuff that there's nothing charming. There's nothing, you know, beautiful uh, about them. And that always bothered me that there seemed to be a trend too much to where the serial killer was something to embrace. You know, I, I never thought it was like, uh, you know, the universal monsters, that, which was a totally different thing because it's obviously not real, but I made it funny too. And I wrote it as, as humor and I wrote it as uh, a, a wicked comment on those kind of people and how silly we are for trying to make them into something that most of them are not. There's certainly some that are, but most of them, you know, they're not uh, living in Italy and in, in chateaus and stuff like that. There's some some guy that lives in a trailer park that's got a hatchet, you know, yeah. and it's, it, you know, and they vary. They're not, I'm not trying to say there's a singular type, but really when you usually see these, they're, they're sort of like gross outsiders most of the time. And so I think one of the things I like to do with horror or crime fiction, because you could call this one crime fiction is to look at the reality and the ugliness of stuff and get away from political correctness where it's out of hand. I'm nothing against, you know, I, I'm very much a social issues kind of guy, but I think if you make it so obvious, that's what you're doing. You don't, it's too on the nose. You don't have the same impact. So when I wrote that story, which I'm sure upset a lot of people, which makes me feel really good because I'm meant to, it is designed <laughs> to make us look at ourselves as much as it is anything else. And, and when people don't get it, you can't put the cliff notes with it. You just have to go on and do it. Uh, Pete, before you go on, uh, Rick and Matt, do you guys have any questions I've for Joe? One. I've go ahead, one. Rick. Go ahead. You mentioned Edgar Rice Burroughs before, Joe. Yes. You got a, yes. had a great chance to uh, collaborate with him posthumously. I did. Can you talk I a little did. more I, about I, it? Yeah, Tarzan, The Lost Adventure. Um, Burroughs had written a partial Tarzan novel and put it in a safe. And I, for, I forget how many pages it was. It was something like 60, 80, something like that. And Dark Horse was doing a, something of mine. And I was on the phone with, I believe it was Jerry Prosser, who was the editor at that time. And he said that, yeah, we're, we got the rights to the Tarzan stuff. And we're going to be doing that. And we're also looking to have somebody finish this novel that Burroughs left unfinished. And it was in the safe and it's been there for years. And I said, man, you ought to get Philip Jose Farmer. I mean, that's the guy. Yeah, they said, well, we were thinking of you. And I said, well, the hell with Philip Jose Farmer. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, I had a great time doing it. But it, it, to tell you the truth, I love Edgar Rice Burroughs, but it was a miserable 80 pages. Most of it was like, you know, he whacked a, 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 a panther or something on every page. And uh, but there was great stuff there. There were moments when you had that burning sort of Burroughs imagination that was inspiring but, you know, his black characters were all completely out of date. And uh, it wasn't a matter of anti-political correctness or political correctness. It was just absurd. You know, it just didn't seem real. So I rewrote and revised that. And I brought other elements into it and stretched the 80 pages, pieces of it throughout the novel, but filled it in. Because it really, you know why? When I read it, I knew why it was in the safe. I know why he didn't finish it. He was burned out, you know, um, and he really didn't want to finish it. And that's why I, th I think it wasn't done, but I got that opportunity and without Burroughs having created those characters and without those certain moments of great imagination and um, just springing off of great ideas, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So 
I, and, and I feel that I'm fortunate to be one of the few, you know, maybe outside of his son to actually work with Burroughs. Maybe I'm the only one, I don't know. And uh, that was great. And then later on, I got to do a Tarzan novella. Uh, and then I did a John Carter of Mars short story. And I've been approached to do more Tarzan, which I may or may not do. I know I'd like to. Um, but yeah, I, I, that was a wonderful moment for me, Rick. Uh, Matt, I really love your t-shirt. Oh, uh, it's chintzy cheap shit. Oh, is it? So what's it say? Um, uh, I don't know. It's got food all over it, though. Oh, uh, that's nice. <laughs> I send you a t-shirt and you get food all over it. Okay. So, my, okay. Uh, so says my I'm, wife, mad, I'm mad about the Lovecraft Easy podcast. My wife you can and I. buy one. I'm trying to talk to our guests here. You're going on. It's all I'm about trying you. to sell t-shirts. Just about man. you, right? Okay. It's all not right. just about me. It's about my t-shirts too. Okay. All right. So my wife and I absolutely loved the Hap and Leonard series. You know, we had like James Purifoy. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right in Rome. That's right. Purifoy. He's been in a lot of shows. And unfortunately, I I love Michael Michael Williams, who was Kay Williams. He was brilliant. You know, I I think he's since died. Hasn't he? Yeah, Um, he did. He, he overdosed uh, which didn't surprise me, but, uh, I, I'm, I didn't know him real well, but I, I miss the fact that he's not in the world anymore. You know? Well, so my question is, what's next that you can talk to us about in terms of uh, other media besides books, graphic novels, magazines? Like, what's um, the next uh, cinema stuff that you might be... Yeah. Well, you know, Peter Dinklage had the thicket for about eight years or nine years that he was going to do, and COVID killed it a couple of times, and finally just... Uh, Late last year, I think it was, he bailed. Uh, and so I, I was, you know, I was disappointed in that because he was perfect for that novel, The Thicket. And uh, I had hoped that he would do that. But um, besides this thing I did uh, based on the Howard Waldrop story, I have a number of things under option. I have a film that I would like to direct that my son did a screenplay based on uh, a story that I wrote. And he's done other screenplays and had some films done. And so we'd hope to do that. And we came close. And again, COVID knocked that one out a couple of times. But I think we're kind of, you know, reworking it now. We're kind of getting a step stool to get climb up a little higher and get that going. And there's, you know, there's financial interest again. And oh, COVID. Uh, there may be a number of TV things that I can't talk about that are on the horizon. And you never know in film until you know, you know, until it's, until it's being done. Uh, so, you know, I really can't say I have a couple of novels that look good. And uh, I, the bottoms has, of course, after Bill Paxton was supposed to do the bottoms, he had it for about eight or nine years. And we worked on trying to get that done. And, you know, most of the work he did and, and the screenplay was written by Brent Hanley who wrote uh, frailty. And uh, that was a big blow when he died because uh, I thought the world of him, he was, uh, he was just a great guy. But that one has had a couple of nibbles and the drive-ins had nibbles and it currently has a nibble. So I, I can't tell you beyond the nibbles uh, because I don't know if they're gonna go beyond that, but I have a few things that look like they're about to happen. So, well, you know, I, I never get excited about film because it's just such a, a wild animal. You never know which way it's going to go or what it's going to do. And yeah. uh, if it happens, yay. And if it doesn't, eh, typical. Now, not everybody may know this, but your your wife actually uh, founded the Horror Writers Association. You want to talk she about did. that for a back second? Then it was a, yeah, a Robert McCammon had this idea for a thing called How, but he didn't want to do it. Right. It took too much time. And so then my wife, we were in an elevator and his then wife, Sally, they were talking about, so, and I, we said something to him and said, oh, must be the, the Lansdales. We recognize the accent because they had, they were Southerners too. So we, we were all Southerners in the elevator and uh, she got to talking to Rick about it and uh, he wasn't going to do it. So she said, look, I'll get all these names and I'll put all this together. So she did all the foundation work and put, you know, the original officers got them elected and went on with that. And then uh, Dean Koontz came along with some money and kindly put effort into it to make it a slicker newsletter and to bring in some things that we could not afford originally. 
And so that's how the HWA was founded. You know, it was, she was the, the backbone. The idea was McCammon, Karen was the backbone. And then Kuntz added to it and gave it, you know, more gloss. And when and it so, started, uh, what was the backbone idea that, the, that you were trying to accomplish? It, it, exactly this? what you're seeing, but we didn't want there to be any awards. We, right. we thought awards made people nutty. And so we, we wanted uh, you're not wrong. to um, just have an organization, make it more kind of like a union, make sure people get paid and make sure people get opportunities that they, they weren't getting and that people were getting screwed by publishers. And uh, I was, I collected money uh, for, I have to say this, every writer that was owed, I got the money for. Them. And uh, so I was the, I don't know what that, you, you know, I guess I was the long arm of the law, <laughs> but I was, I was just a pest until I got people paid. Uh, but it was called Howl originally, then it was the Horror Writers of America, and now it's the Horror, Horror Writers Association. But I think about that, my, my wife uh, putting those things in, in Xerox, you know, making these little things, stapling them, and uh, doing them in a more crude sort of way, and putting them out there, and it just catching fire. And yeah. uh, so all of you who, have your, uh, who know about the HWA or members or anything like that, that's where it came from. They owe your, your wife a huge debt. So sounds like yes. to me, uh, what, 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 what is your, uh, this is a little off track, but what is your opinion on awards in general when it comes to writing or the arts at all? I'm not opposed to them. I think it's nice for the, uh, people to recognize their own, but I think people are nutty about them. You know, I, I've won a lot of horror writer awards. I've won a lot of awards, but I've never campaigned once for an award. Ellison, mm -hmm. I love Harlan in many ways, but he was, you know, he was also uh, just a wild man about things like that. He was very insecure, I think. But he would call me, want me to vote for him for stuff. And I said, I don't vote for people who ask me to vote for him. And I said, second of all, I'm not in the HWA anymore. Because <laughs> at some point, even though my wife founded it, I didn't stay in it. And uh, then later, uh, my wife and I both were reinducted lifetime members. And she was given the Richard Lehman Award for her uh, work inside the, you know, the the, the organization but I, i'm not against awards i just don't understand why people are so nuts for them because for the most part they don't change your career much or maybe the no, they don't. gave me a yeah the edgar probably kicked me up a little little bit but the hwa awards are just great to get them from your peers but as far as like how they influence your career or whatever they don't i think the most prestigious out there is probably the shirley jackson award i in my no. opinion no what do you think no, the Edgar, the Edgar is the Edgar hands down. Hands uh, down. The, the Edgar is the one that people know and care about because there are more crime and suspense and thriller readers than there are horror readers, but the Shirley Jackson award is prestigious, but I'm talking about impactful. So it's right, a different right, thing, right, right, right. you know, all right. of them have their own prestige am among their groups, but the Shirley Jackson award, you couldn't find anybody that on the street that knew that. And you're not going to find many that know Edgar but you're going to know a whole lot more that know the Edgar when it's plastered on those thriller novels, people notice that, but the Shirley Jackson award, a lot of people who read horror are a smaller number than will ever read thriller. You know, Dean Kuhn said, said to me once that he thought that, that you should decide to call yourself a thriller writer or suspense writer, because every month there were thrillers on the bestseller list. And, and he really wanted that. He wanted the bestseller list and more mm -hmm. power to him. I don't think there's a thing wrong with that. Well, but, you got it. He's right. Most you don't once in a while you'll see Stephen King on there. And and there was a period when you saw a lot of people, but you look at it now and there are not many. There are some that bounce in and hit and go. But if crime, suspense, mystery, those are the things that make up a lot of the bestseller list, not counting some some literary mainstream novels that are also on that list. Although mainstream and literary novels don't sell near the amount that um, crime and mystery do. The Bottoms, which won an Edgar that I wrote, one that won an Edgar, has gone on and on and on. And if you took all my Happen Leonard books and put them together, the Bottoms has outsold all of them. Although that's starting to change. They're, they're catching up because I guess the series and more books along the line. But that Edgar written on that book impacts. And the Shirley Jackson Award on there would not impact, though it would for us because we're a different group of folks. Right. I, I, I guess I was speaking just for horror. Um, yeah, well, just for horror. Um, I still think the Bram Stoker is probably the one that more people know. 
And yeah. uh, whether it's impactful or not, that's another question. But I, I don't know that the Shirley Jackson changes anybody's life either. It, it maybe should. It but does. I don't. Yeah. You no, know, I don't <laughs> think any of the awards do. Like I said, the Edgar got some impact in the past, in the 50s and the 60s or whenever it was, the Spur, which I've also won the spur for best western novel used to have impact but that went away after the 70s and now it is a small group of you know aficionados who really love that sort of thing yeah when when i was selling books rare books um the people that were collecting hugo winners or nebula winners or stoker winners were few and far between but yeah. i had 20 or 30 people that consistently wanted the edgar Right. And it's so right. that does impact some collecting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it impacts sales. You know, it, 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 um, it used to, I think it's a little less in the last few years, but used to, if you had an egg on there, all of a sudden people were looking at it for film too. And they were looking at it for TV or they were looking at it for these other outlets. And I, I don't know that that's as true now as it was just 10 years ago, but all of that is beginning to diminish because the, the field is so spread wide with self-published and different kinds of, uh, you know, eBooks and everything else that it's not as impactful as it once was because it's not as contained as it once was. Yeah. Pete, any more questions yeah. for Joe? I got one wrap up question, Joe. Sure. Okay. You have, you've written some of the most iconic characters. I mean, Tarzan, Batman, Jonah Hex, what haven't you done that you really want to, that you haven't been given? I've been asked that. I've been asked that. You know, I don't know what, what the answer is to that. Uh, I, I've enjoyed doing all of those and meant to do every one of them, but uh, I got most of them. Now, there's probably somebody, maybe Doc Savage. I was actually asked about doing a Doc Savage once, but I, I couldn't even entertain it. I was, it was a time when Phil Farmer was doing one. And mm -hmm. it was that same era. And uh, it was mentioned to me by someone maybe connected with that. And I don't even know how well the connected they were. And it sure crossed my mind. But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to write in those other styles. You know, I, I, Burroughs I could do in my sleep, but I also could not keep from making it me to some extent. Same way with Batman, all of them. And uh, so if I did Doc Savage, I, I would want to actually try to bring it into a, a kind of mainstream Doc Savage where you keep the genre, you keep the pulp, but you you deal more with the psychology of it, you know, because it's a weird it's a weird psychology. Actually, when you think about uh, giving criminals these changes in their brain so they're not criminals anymore and society looks on that with some uh, displeasure, you know, and yet they look on it with some interest. And I think that conflict is, is what's interesting because, you know, you think, well, it'd be great for criminals not to be criminal. But then you think, do you really have the right to go into somebody, <laughs> somebody's brain? Because do you know, are they going to be criminal again? Or are they going to, you know, what is that? What is that great Philip K. Dick story that they filmed with Tom Cruise where you, oh, know, yeah. you predict people? Minority are Report. Uh, minority, minority Report. report. Yeah. 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 So that, that, re so I've written a story called uh, Villains by Necessity, where the children of Jack the Ripper and who happens to be Mr. Hyde are running rampant. I like that. They're running rampant through London. And Moriarty and Fu Manchu hire a child killer who was drummed out of the service because he killed children. And they need him. Yeah. Yeah, because I get that in the on the far side of the Cadillac Desert, you know, the guy that uh, yeah. the, that wasn't the, the main guy, he was a despicable person. But you know, uh, yeah, I mean, that I find that very, very intriguing. But all of those different pulp heroes, all those different ones, I'd, I'd write about almost any of them, you know, okay. if, if I was in the mood, I was asked to do I did Zorro and I did a short story of Zorro, but I, I thought the anthology was so clingy and that the people there were so had already decided how it had to be done. I like to see things experimented with. Yeah. Uh, I would like to do the Green Hornet, but I want to do it my way. You know, I'd want to keep all the Green Hornet tropes and everything there, but uh, I would like to write it 
in in the way I wrote Batman, you know. And so if I somebody were to give me that lick and pay me enough, I got approached to do uh, Harley Quinn once, and and thought I would do it. It was fun, but I just I looked at it. And I said, you know, it just doesn't pay enough for the effort that I would put into it uh, with Paul Dini, who I really admire, who worked on the series. And uh, so I was approached about that, and I didn't do it. I, I don't know who ended up doing it, but it was it was intriguing, you know. Uh, Quinn's not one of my absolute favorites, but she's always been curious to me, and I, I thought that that might be kind of interesting. My daughter actually portrayed Harley Quinn in at Warner Brothers in those plays that they do uh, on the, you know at the parks, and okay. so there's pictures of her as Harley Quinn, and she looked great, you know. She she looked the part. Yeah, so it was kind of fun. Casey did, huh? Well, speaking of Casey, this is a great way to wrap up. I've uh, talked with her um, in an interview, and I've emailed her back and forth over the last year. And I found so endearing the fact that she says, my dad is Batman. Uh, I think she said, my dad, <laughs> my dad is Batman and a Prius. So yeah. my son has similar thoughts. <laughs> well, uh, I just... Sweet. That's the ultimate compliment, I think, for for a child. It to is. Look at their my son dad wrote way. an article that I wrote an article called "My Dad Is Batman." Uh, yeah. that's been published a, around a few places, and and that's very Kay. sweet. I'm I'm Casey very did too, very didn't happy. She? Uh, she she is, I, she's probably said that. I don't know that she's written anything about it. Oh, okay. Uh, she's written a lot of short stories though, and and she yeah. and I've collaborated on some and collaborated on some. And she's written a lot of her own and Keith has done all sorts of stuff, but I'm very proud of both of them primarily because they're good people. I, I never asked them of anything, but their character. That's all yeah. I cared about was their, was, was their character. And they, they have good character and the rest of it's just icing on the cake. You know, well, and, you're right. Uh, I should talk to Keith. I've talked to Casey. She's a very nice young lady. Um, she's got a collection coming up, doesn't she? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, she and I have, have our collections coming up. We have, uh, She's got almost enough for her own collection, but we have a collection coming from uh, Thunderstorm uh, Books, which uh, is a, uh, uh, I think it's called Dark Ten. It's all of the short stories that we've written together, or at least that have been published to date. And then we've got one coming from SST, which was published as a paperback a few years back, was Terra uh, is Our Business, and it's being done in hardback, gorgeous art. And uh, so we have both of those coming up and she's got some stories coming out here and there. And we've got a couple of things that we're going to do together. My son and I wrote a novel called big lizard, which is kind of a superhero novel about a guy that's uh, a big lizard. <laughs> and and plus uh, your, so, yeah, uh, I, I love, I love working with the kids and I, I hate collaborating with almost anybody, but I find it fun with them. And um, it's just good to see the kind of people they've grown up into being that that's important to me. And she's a very talented singer. Yeah, beautiful woman, great singer. Uh, I mean, she's got everything going for her, and and most of all, she's got she's again that she's got good character. Uh, in the to close up, uh, as usual, in the show notes, I've got books for your TBR because that's the the complaint quote unquote that I get about the show that I keep adding to people's TBRs. I've got Joe's uh, complete drive-in, born for trouble. And of course, uh, you can look up all uh, Joe's other books. Uh, next week, we've got a gentleman, a writer by the name of Matthew Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S. He wrote a book called A Black and Endless Sky. And I've got the, the link to that as well. Queen of No Tomorrows by uh, one of my patrons I've read. And that is very, very good. Check that out. I've got the link to that as, as well. Um, Joe, I wanted to show you this. 1939 Batman that my son gave me. Yep. So yep. I recognize the ears. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I wanted to, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to take this out of the package or not, uh, Pete. You can tell me. But one of my favorite movies is the, is the Fog from 1980. Oh, I remember John Carpenter. Yes. Yeah. And Kelly, Kelly Young does not agree with me that it's a great movie. I don't uh, agree with you either. Well, you're <laughs> you're both wrong. You're both wrong. But anyway, he knows I like how much John I love Carpenter, but I, I don't I don't think that's a great one. I think he did some great ones, that's for sure. It's the better than the remake. Kind of, 
it's it's well okay. anyway the the the, well, yeah. the fun well, thing yeah, is yeah, that okay. uh the, the fun thing is that uh kelly knows how much i love the movie he actually sent me the lp of the of the of the soundtrack a while back and he just sent me this captain blake who is the main antagonist of course so i, I just had to show that to wow. everybody and you being a batman fan obviously I don't know if you've read this book or not, Joe. It's Batman Fear Itself. Michael Reeves is one Michael of my Reeves. favorite guys. He he's who I work for at the animated series. Michael really? Reeves. And have I have you read this? Into one of his collections. No. It's a really no. good Batman book. There's some terrible Batman books out there, Joe, but uh, no, this is really good. good. <laughs> no, you you, you know, did. I wrote Batman novel. I wrote Captain uh, Captured by the Engines, and yeah. uh, I'm very proud of that one. So. I don't know this one. Yeah, it's it's yeah. called Fear, Fear Let me Itself. Write it down here. Yeah, yeah. and it's I by. I figured you knew him. No, I know uh, Michael. Uh, he was my he was my boss really at uh, Batman the Animated Series. He was my yeah. main editor. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's, a, guy, it's 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 a really great book, and it starts on Halloween, and uh, you know, just wow. to give you a, just to give you a flavor of the first few sentences, it was autumn in Gotham City. Um, it was a remarkable day, thought Alfred Pennyworth as he turned the Bentley onto Churchward Street. He wondered if his passenger had noticed this. He had never asked him, are you aware of such things as fallen leaves or the taste of a coming frost or the crystalline quality of the sunlight? Do these things still touch you, stir you, make you long to linger on an autumn sidewalk or lie among the leaves looking up into the pale blue vault? Um, you know, he's kind of thinking to himself. Yeah, I love Michael's work. I like yeah. his work a lot. Like I said, well, I wrote an introduction to a collection of short stories, and I thought they were brilliant. Yeah, well, uh, shoot me an email after you read this, Joe. Let me know what you think, because I love it. It's, it's really yeah, great. I'm going to I'm gonna try to find a copy of it, and then I, it, if I read it, I'll let you know. It should be easy. I think there's some used copies on Amazon. Okay. So okay. I don't think it's in Kindle, but there's some used copies on Amazon, paperbacks. All right. I did a um, children's book too, a Batman. I just remembered uh, called Terra on the High Skies. Yes. Oh, weirdly, I've never done out. a comic. I've never done a Batman comic. A <laughs> um, couple of quick announcements, and then we'll let everybody go, including Joe. Uh, hey, I have. Hey, uh, I got an announcement too, buddy. Yeah, I know you do. Um, I've got a new uh, horror playlist, horror short story playlist on the on the Love Cartesian YouTube channel, which if you're watching, that's where you are right now. Um, the it, it starts off with the festival read by Soren Narnia of Knife Point Horror. If you know Knife Point Horror, then you know what a great storyteller Soren Narnia is and what a great voice he has. But this is not going to be a Lovecraft playlist. We just started with that. The next story actually is going to be a short story by my friend Jeffrey Ford. Um, and it's going to be read by John Padgett. So that'll be coming up. So anyway, my point is to the audience, you can look forward to uh, a short story playlist, almost kind of like a fiction podcast. Uh, like this is a nonfiction podcast. And... Uh, <laughs> If you're not a Patreon, uh, please become one. Just Google Lovecraft Easy and Patreon because there's a lot of extra content that you don't get um, in addition to what you get here. So uh, any other questions for Joe before we let him go? Thank you so much for coming on. It was really a lot yes. of fun. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. You yeah. guys take care. I'm going to jump. You too. Thank you, Joe, for Thank being you. here. Bye. Have a great afternoon. Bye.